Welcome to the podcast. As someone who is keenly interested in history, I am of course aware of the transatlantic slave trade that enslaved millions of Africans, sold them at auction, at trading posts, such as Gori Island in Senegal, and then brought them to North America to work on plantations. This dark legacy continues to impact African Canadian and African American communities. Thankfully, the transatlantic slave trade was abolished in the 19th century, and those slaves were freed from their bondage, if not from the legacy of slavery. However, slavery did not end in the 19th century. It has morphed and changed. It has taken on new forms to harm and exploit people in every corner of the globe. According to the International Labor Organization, there are over 40 million modern slaves. Women and children make up 71% of all modern slaves, with about 10 million being children. This is more than three times the amount of the transatlantic slave trade. Senator Matt Freeman joined us. He's, he's from the Mekong Club to talk about this very important issue that probably doesn't get talked about as much as it should. Um, it was very enlightening, but also very scary to see how easy it is for people to fall into slavery. You know, a person that is vulnerable, that is looking for another job in a neighboring country that is trafficked on a fishing boat, or a person that has borrowed money for a medical ailment that finds themselves in debt bondage to a farmer, or, you know, realistically and sadly, a poor child forced to work in a garment factory. These are all easy ways that people find themselves inadvertently or otherwise in slavery. So it was a very good discussion and I think we should get to it. Today's conversation is all about human slavery. Most people could be forgiven for thinking that slavery has been relegated to the past and they would be wrong. People will be surprised to know today, not only that modern day slavery exists, but it is a thriving industry. So there is no one better than our guest today to talk to us about it, this most pernicious of criminal activities that ensnares women, boys and girls in its uh, clutches. He is an international human trafficking expert who has been fighting the modern slave trade for decades. He has worked for the US government in these efforts, for multilateral efforts against human trafficking, for civil society groups in China, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Thailand, and Vietnam. Today, Mr. Friedman is CEO of the Mekong Club, an organization that is mobilizing the private sector in its fight against modern slavery. Thank you for taking the time to speak to us today, Matt. So my first question, yeah, my first question is, I have visited Cambodia and sailed down the mighty Mekong. So as a first, can you tell us why your organization, which is fighting modern day slavery, is called the Mekong Club? You know, I actually get that question quite often. Why would you have an organization that works with the private sector to help them to understand human trafficking? Would you call them the Mekong, which most people don't know what it is, in a club. The reason for this is when our organization was set up, it was set up by individuals from the private sector in Hong Kong who came to understand and accept the fact that what we were talking about was a really important topic. And they said, instead of there being an outside organization addressing this, we want something in Hong Kong. But we need an organization that isn't going to scare the private sector away. If we use human rights this or human trafficking that in the name, nobody's going to want to join. So they said, come up with a name that is gentle, that's easy for people to accept. So because the Mekong River, going back to your reference, goes through all the countries in Southeast Asia, we decided to use Mekong. And we used club because we thought it was gentle. It didn't really mean anything and it wasn't going to frighten anyone away. So the Mekong Club unlike what advertisers and promotional people say where you're supposed to have the title kind of say what it is you're doing, does just the opposite, makes it very vague so that people can find out about this, 
join it without being concerned that somebody's going to ask, are you joining that human rights group because you have a problem? So it reduces the business risk associated with that. Certainly, my, my memory of the Mekong is one of a certain kind of gentleness. So I'm certainly hoping uh, for you uh, that lots of corporations uh, join your movement because we'll, we'll get to uh, the role of the corporate sector in a minute. But perhaps you could tell us, uh, because most people you know, live in a bubble, cannot conceive of slavery in our times, at least not in Canada and I imagine other parts of the developed world. Uh, can you tell us about the depth and scale of the slavery, of the slave trade? Um, who are the victims? Who are the perpetrators? That would be uh, essential information for this conversation. In your opening statement, you talked about a lot of people think that uh, slavery is something from the past. Well, it isn't. There are 40 million people in modern slavery around the world. In fact, there are more slaves today than any other time in history. 9.2 million people enter slavery a year. In a single day, 25,200 or a new slave every four seconds. Okay, so let's talk about what we mean with slavery. I mean, it's a very loaded word. Basically, what we're talking about are individuals who are in a situation where they're trapped, they can't leave and they don't get paid. So for the most part, it's basically the same dynamic that we've seen in slavery many, many years ago. But unlike that legal slavery, which it used to be many years ago, this is uh, kind of an illegal type thing that's existed for years, but nobody paid any attention to it. So let, let me give you a couple of examples. A 13-year-old uh, girl in Nepal is approached by a trafficker. He comes in. He says, I'm looking for a wife. I want to marry you. He goes to the family. Uh, they actually go through a wedding ceremony. Everybody's saying, wow, he's rich. He's handsome. Everything's going to be great. He says he's going to take the girl to Kathmandu, but instead he takes her to Mumbai, India. He puts her in a room and he says, honey, stay here. I'll be back in a few minutes. He then goes to the madam to get the uh, 500 US dollars for having sold her to the, uh, the brothel. He has the gold from the wedding and he hands the wedding pictures over. He then goes to Nepal to return to do this again 40, 50 times in a year. The madam then goes into the room and says, guess what? Your husband just sold you to me and you're going to be with 10 guys a day every day because I say so. You can imagine her shock. No, no, no. My husband loves me. So that's the way it is. Many of the girls, when they hear that, say, I'll kill myself before I do those shameful things. The madam then brings out the picture of uh, the, uh, the wedding and says, is this your mom, your dad, your brother? If you hurt yourself, we'll hurt them. So she's trapped in this situation. To make her into a prostitute, it's quite simple. You shame her. They bring in a couple of prep professional rapists and over a two day time, they rape this poor girl maybe 20, 30 times until eventually she just lays back and accepts whatever happens to her. This is an example of sex trafficking. We see similar examples all over the world, including Canada, in the UK, the United States, Japan, everywhere. Different scenario, but the outcome is pretty much the same. So that's sex trafficking, and that represents about a quarter of the cases. And the perpetrators in this particular case are the pimps and the madams and the people who run those types of syndicates. Other forms of uh, Trafficking would be forced labor situations. An example of that, a 15-year-old boy from Cambodia thinks he's going to go out to sea for three months on a fishing boat. He gets tricked and deceived into it, goes on the boat. The boat goes out, but it doesn't come back after three years. It stays out for four years. This poor kid will end up working 17, 18, 19 hours a day. If he doesn't, he gets beaten and tortured. The only food he'll have during this time is rice and fish. To get him to work, they give strong stimulants. If he gets sick or injured, they throw him off the side of the boat. At the end of the four years, the boat comes in, he gets nothing. Or a sweatshop situation where a person is told that they can work in a factory, but they can't leave the factory. They have to stay there. And maybe they're promised the equivalent of 50 US dollars. They go into the factory, they work for a couple of months, they ask for the pay. The manager says, well, you know, I forgot to mention one thing. It costs $54 for you to live here. I'm only paying you $50. You owe me money. And you can't leave until you pay it back. So basically, they're in a situation where every day they get deeper and deeper and deeper into debt. 
There's no way out of this debt. Sometimes they work for years without a single day out, uh, off. You just imagine what that does to the hopes and dreams and aspirations of the people. So these are just three uh, variations. There's many, many variations. We find it in agriculture, fishing, construction, um, um, manufacturing, hospitality. All of these sectors have the possibility of this being uh, this kind of a problem. Those those figures are stunning. 40 million people, the coal transactionality uh, that you described, um, you know, I, I'm moved and stunned and horrified yet once again. But the truth is that many people think uh, that these kinds of horrendous uh, activities and situations exist only offshore, but as you pointed out, they can exist right here. And we may well be unwitting participants in modern day slavery because we buy and consume products uh, which are manufactured by corporations uh, who in their global supply chain may well be uh, participants, unwitting or not, in labor market slavery. So I, I refer to the recent report published by the Australian Strategic Policy Institute that uh, documented religious and ethnic minorities being used in, um, in, uh, as forced labor in factories in the supply chains of 82, not one or two, but 82 well-known global brands such as Apple, BMW, Gap, Nike, Samsung, and the list goes on, Volkswagen. So in your opinion, what is their role? I mean, these are uh, global corporations with a global with global brands and customers. What is their role in 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 ending this uh, pernicious practice in their supply chain? But, you know, the thing is, is that most corporations for many, many years have actually been doing things. And let me give you an example. You know, the way a modern manufacturing supply chain works, you have three tiers. The top tier would be uh, where they actually assemble, say the running shoe. The second tier is where the shoelaces and the rivets and the zippers and everything else comes from. Different companies that feed this. And then the last one would be the raw materials, the metal, the cotton and so forth. The issue is this, most companies have been kind of auditing tier one for at least 25, 30 years. And they have gone in there and they've identified that in fact there aren't issues and problems, but they haven't really been looking at tier two or three. And that's where a lot of the potential problem exists. Now, because of the legislation that you mentioned in Australia and other parts of the world, the expectation is that they have to go all the way down to the lowest level in order to address this. But then it raises the question, how are they going to do this? If they have, for example, been auditing 1400 tier one companies, and for each of those, they have five tier two and even more tier three, you're talking about thousands and thousands of audits. And so as a result of this, the corporations are struggling to figure out well, what's the best way of doing this? Who is the cost going to be handed over to this? And so what we're beginning to see is the private sector, those same companies that you were talking about coming together and saying, listen, we don't need to all audit the same zipper company. Why don't you do the zipper company? We'll do the rivet company. You do the shoe yeah. company. And so they begin to share this type of data. So what we're seeing is a reconfiguring of what it's what's happening. Now, the issue that you mentioned in China of the internment camp people actually being in a situation where uh, they're entering into the factories. A lot of the brands that I deal with are struggling with this question because they've had footprints in China for a long time. They had no idea this was happening. It was identified to them at this particular time with COVID-19. They can't get to those locations to do the audits, to find out what's happening on the ground. And so it's a real problem for private sector companies. Now, a lot of people, let me just say this, because I think this is an important point, think that companies really don't care and they would use slaves to get shareholder profits. In reality, companies have three motivations, profit, prestige, and growth. All of these are compromised if there's some type of a scandal or problem that makes it into the papers. So they're aggressively trying to identify what they need to do in order to protect their business. 
because if they don't, this becomes a tremendous business risk for them. Is there certain sort of uh, uh, conditions for people that are victims of of modern slavery? You know, is is there certain things that make them particularly vulnerable? Poverty, um, social isolation, anything like that that makes the victims or, or just individuals particularly vulnerable to being, you know, caught up in modern slavery and forced into either sex trafficking, forced labor, or things like that? Yeah, a lot of it is uh, an expectation of a better life. You know, some people say that they're so poor, they were so desperate that they sold their kids into modern slavery. You know, the thing is, is this, you know, whether you're rich or poor, you, you know, most people love their kids and those circumstances happen, but not very often. Poverty is a potential indicator, but it's usually poverty plus something else. And I know this because I lived in Bangladesh for uh, five years. And during the time we were there, we assumed that everyone was vulnerable to human trafficking because of the poverty there. And eventually we did a survey, we interviewed 1500 people and came to realize that most of the people who were entering into modern slavery situations weren't the poorest of the poor. They were the emerging middle class. And the reason for this is they got a little bit of taste of prosperity. They started to take more risks. They started to invest in migration and they were the ones that basically were finding themselves in that situation. The important point behind this is that we can't make assumptions that are over generalizations. We have to really look into the data to find out what are the vulnerabilities, what allows a person to be in this type of situation. One other example is sex trafficking. A lot of the victims associated with sex trafficking are people from broken homes. There's been incest, there's been abuse, there's been rape. Something about that dynamic is picked up by the people who are the pimps and the madams, and they are basically groom a person into a situation where she's eventually forced into it. So that vulnerability of that kind of broken family situation becomes uh, a big issue. If I want to find potential trafficking victims, I go to hospitals. Why? Because you have people who all of a sudden have an acute need for money to pay for something. Or if somebody's about to buy land, they're going to borrow from somebody because one of the biggest indicators and in problems is debt. That's what really ties about 75% of people into things. And that's why the traffickers say, we're not doing slavery. They owe us money. Well, it's fraudulent debt. It's illegal debt. But nevertheless, that's what they use as justification for holding somebody. Uh, in the Canadian Senate, we've recently debated uh, modern day slavery because one of my colleagues, Senator Julie Nouvelle Duchesne from Quebec, has uh, tabled legislation uh, to address, uh, you know, uh, labor market slavery in the supply chain. And if it's approved, if it's passed, this bill will uh, impose an obligation on corporations to report on the measures that they themselves take to prevent and reduce the risk of forced labor or child labor in their supply chain. Very much, I, I think, a reflection or of the work that you're doing with the Mekong Club. Uh, in addition, uh, the bill would uh, allow for the prohibition on the importation of goods and and goods manufactured or produced by forced labor or child labor. Um, what are your thoughts on this bill? Um, you know, will first of all, is this something that would uh, uh, address in 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 a small or a big way uh, forced labor in the global supply chain? And secondly. Um, how could we improve the bill? Because that's what we do as legislators. We take a piece of legislation and we say, let's make it better. So what are your thoughts on that? Thank you for that question. The first legislation was the California Transparency and Supply Chain Act. And basically all it said was, put on your website what you're doing to address modern slavery. Then the UK came out and said, uh, we are going to do that, but we're going to insist on an annual report and that annual report has to be signed by a board of directors. And that went a little bit farther. And then the Australian went said, we'll do those two things, but we're going to go a little bit farther. We're going to have an inventory and that inventory is going to be looked at and so forth. All of the legislation leading up to the Canadian legislation seems to have added on something related to uh, a new addition. And the Canadian one has that 
trade customs element to it, basically saying that products can't come in that are related to modern slavery. Um, the reason why I think this legislation is relevant and important for each country isn't because um, you, you necessarily need it. Actually, the UK Modern Slavery Act covers all the Canadian companies that are of any size. What it does do, though, is it creates awareness within the country. Companies all of a sudden are debating and discussing and determining whether or not they feel like it's the right to do this. And all of a sudden they're exposed to, wow, we have not only in Canada, but in our supply chains around the world, this issue. The uh, addition that I would put to the, uh, to the Canadian legislation based on what I've seen is that you have the same standards that exist within the other locations, but more of an emphasis on somebody is going to really look at that data to see whether or not the people are really filling it out, because in a lot of countries that have the legislation, only about 50 percent of the uh, identified organizations are actually uh, filling it out. The second thing is you have the care, I mean, the stick, but you don't have a carrot. You know, there are some companies that are only going to do things if they are told that if they don't do it, something bad is going to happen to them. But there are other companies that are incentivized by doing the right thing. In this day and age of corporate social responsibility, ESGs, uh, the uh, sustainability development goals, business with purpose, there's a certain percentage of companies that recognize that by being on the forefront of wanting to address this type of issue, um, you know, they're going to get points for that. Consumers are going to expect that. And I'll say another thing, and this is really important at this particular day and age, with the Black Lives Matters emphasis, the statues of enslavers coming down in the United States, the rebranding of things, there is an ultra sensitivity to the topic of slavery in general, whether it's historical slavery or modern slavery. There was an organization in the UK recently was caught in a situation where they were underpaying people, safety conditions, and slavery was attributed to them. And all of a sudden, what in the past would have been kind of a, a couple of newspaper articles resulted in them really getting seriously reamed as a result of this particular process. And so I think it's extremely important that the legislation have both the potential to encourage through, uh, you know, the uh, this is what's going to happen if you if you don't do this, but also encourage companies to be on the right side and to to be rewarded for their behavior. So you've talked about, uh, you know, legislation in, in, in specific jurisdictions building on each other. And that is that is great that we can go down this path. But what is the role of multilateral institutions that we may all belong to as nation states. You know, I'm thinking, uh, let's say the World Trade Organization, which regulates trade. Do they have a role? You know, I worked for the United Nations for six years and I'm putting my hand on my heart when I say this. I believe in the United Nations system, but I spent a lot of time in five star hotels eating really good food, <laughs> talking about poverty. Um, this isn't too downgrade the importance of what they do. They have a role in terms of policy making, in terms of kind of getting companies to work with each other and so forth, but they're too high up. They're like 30,000 feet looking down. And so it's, it hasn't been effective as far as I'm concerned. Now, World Trade Organizations, the ILO, IOM, various other organizations like that, um, you know, try to have conferences in the and the conventions and everything. And those things are super important. I, I don't want to denigrate those things, but it really at the end of the day, the organizations that are do, have been doing the lion's share of the work are the NGOs. They're on the ground, they're addressing the issues, they're, they're working on it, but much of their emphasis has been on sex trafficking. Mm -hmm. When it comes to forced labor, many of them don't have the experience. They don't have a business background. It has to be the corporations themselves. The reason why we work with corporations is because they understand supply chains. They understand how they work and they have the leverage, the legal support, the ability to address it. But in order to get corporations to, to do this, you need the legislation. And that's why the legislation is so important. So legislation is certainly one route to go in. I support this bill, but I'm also thinking there is another player in all of this, and that is the consumer. You know, if, if the consumer stopped 
to buy or made a choice of buying one brand over the other, uh, then you would see a shift in some of these practices. Um, after all, the customer is king. So what about educating the consumer about these uh, issues? Yeah, I mean, uh, people ask that question a lot. And the, the problem with kind of determining who's on the naughty and nice list is that unless you have an objective way of analyzing everybody's supply chain, it's really difficult to know. And so every once in a while, an organization gets caught in a situation where somewhere in their supply chain, they found a forced labor situation. It makes it into the news, but it doesn't mean that all those other organizations don't have the same problem. The way we approach it is rather than saying don't buy or uh, have a, a boycott, uh, which basically says you don't buy because they're bad, we focus on a buy cop, which is the opposite. You identify companies that are doing everything they can to try to protect their business. So our advice and guidance to young people and to the general public is go online and see whether or not the company that you like basically has a policy related to modern slavery that's uh, out there, easy to find. If they do, send them an email and congratulate them. If they don't say this and I like your product, I'd feel a lot better if I had that type of um, policy in place. Another thing, I, I was in the North America, I did a talk. I had like 10 students come up to me afterwards and say they wanted to do something related to supply chains. So I said, okay, is there a big department store in town? And they said, yes. And I said, okay, every day for the next eight days, there are eight students. I want one of you to go into there and go to the manager and ask him one simple question. How do we know that all this stuff that's in this store isn't tainted by modern slavery? In a very positive, you know, questioning way. There's no animosity. There's no aggressiveness. The first day they went, guy said, I don't know. Second day, I don't know. Third day, I don't know. Fourth day, he had a piece of paper in his hand. He read it. Fifth day, he did it from uh, his memory. Sixth day, that piece of paper was at the cash register. Seventh day, that person. So if, if companies know that you know, uh, consumers care, they're gonna pay attention to this. But the problem with the naming and shaming approach is again, sometimes it's not fair because only a few organizations are gonna be identified, but it also creates a chilling effect where companies pull back. Corporations have tremendous potential to add value to addressing this, but they're not gonna do it if they feel like they're gonna be somehow named and shamed in the process. I like the idea of a boycott instead of a boycott you know i'm thinking maybe we come to a time when they're on the on the labels of the product just as you know some products say asbestos free that we would be at a time when the label could say free of uh, of slavery but maybe that's uh, imagining out into the future um, my question though is you know about the present in our debates in the canadian senate when i rose to speak about this or someone else did, I forget. One of the questions asked uh, by one of my colleagues was one of the reasons human slavery exists is because, you know, as you said, there is poverty, there is hunger, there is debt, uh, there's a conflation of circumstances, but there's also an absence of, of education that is available. So, you know, you, you at the same time as we are trying to eradicate human slavery, we should also be building the capacity of jurisdictions around the world to offer public schools and, 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 and good quality schooling to their children. And those go hand in hand. Um, I, I don't think the question was, you know, what comes first? The question was, we must do this and we must do that. Can you can you comment on on this kind of uh, construct? I, I can't emphasize enough the importance of education for so many different things. It helps in health. It helps in opportunity. It helps build minds. It helps build a, a sense of optimism and hope and so forth. I would add one thing to it. I would say the education needs to be there, but the education also needs to address the issue of modern slavery. Let me give you an example. In Thailand, there was a situation where um, a lot of girls dropped out in the 10th grade. And so after that, a certain percentage of them were trafficked over time. And so the jurisdiction said, let's keep them in school at the 11th and 12th grade and we won't have human trafficking. So they had this program 25 years because the assumption is if you're in school, you're not gonna be trafficked. When we finally evaluated the program, we came to realize that after they graduated, many of them 
as a result of this education had an increase chance of human trafficking. And the reason for that is the expectation of the parents are, my daughter is more educated. I can send her down to Bangkok. She can work in an office. Uh, they send her down there. She can't find a job because she's competing with the urban people who are better connected. She can't go home. She'll lose face. They get trafficked. And so by not building into that educational program, the fact that you can get trafficked, they were being trafficked. Now, uh -huh. people have to understand there's a certain percentage of young mostly women, sometimes boys, that are going to get trafficked into the sex industry in Canada. And part of the reason why that's able to happen is there is no education that basically helps them. So I know that goes a little bit beyond what you were describing, but uh, certainly I agree that education offers opportunities for people to kind of get out of the situation they're in and across the world, we should have more of that. And, and it's an important part of the process. But again, within education, we need to create awareness. And, I, and I'll go one step further and say, it's not just in schools. I, when I did my trip across Canada last year, um, visited uh, corporations, banks, uh, faith-based groups, general public, and so forth. And if I got up in front of 100 people, I would say less than 10 of them knew 25% of what I was saying before I said it. If you don't know about an issue, you're not going to care. If you don't care, you're not going to do anything. So awareness across the board with general populations in the central part of raising the foundation for this. And the other reason why that's important is within that 100 people, there's going to be five that for whatever reason, this is an issue that gets under their skin. They're going to come up after and say, what can I do to help? If they happen to be within corporations, we tag, tag those individuals. We work with them. We train them. We empower them. If it's within schools, we do the same type of thing because those are the people that are going to carry these things forward in the communities that you have there in Canada. Is there is there a certain role uh, to build off of that for for the victims that are currently in uh, human slavery right now and modern slavery right now, either you know sex trafficking or forced labor? Is there a, a, a f an enforcement mechanism that is needed more so? Uh, is there even education for that matter within uh, you know various uh, law enforcement agencies or otherwise to be able to recognize the signs of of uh, sex trafficking or modern slavery? I, and I'm wondering and the reason why I say that is because there's a lot of people that will be caught up into this and, and they need to find a way out. So what is a way out for individuals to be able to find that may find themselves in it or or family members that may have someone that they suspect another family member that is in in modern slavery? What's a way out for an for, you know, a, a, this is a, obviously a you know specific question to a very general problem. But uh, is there a way out for people that they can they can find? All right, there's three or four answers to that. I'll try to give all of them. One of them is when it comes to prostitution in Canada or North America or other parts of the world, the police are used to use looking at these individuals as if they're somehow doing a criminal activity. It's really difficult for them to kind of go from you're a criminal to you're a victim. So a tremendous amount of training is needed to allow for law enforcement to, un to make that change. And, uh, you know, when I was in... Uh, Bangladesh, uh, we had a situation where, um, you know, they would do a raid uh, and they would find, uh, say, 30 women and girls in a situation and they'd come back and say, well, we don't have any trafficking victims. And I said, OK, well, what did you do? And they said, well, we arrested them, put them in the paddy wagon, sent them to the jail. They stayed there for three hours. And then we went and said, are you trafficking victims? They said no. So we said, let's change the formula. You uh, don't arrest them. You bring them to a shelter. You have a woman who has years of training. You sit down, you counsel them, and you'll find that most of them are trafficking victims. So that's that's part of the problem. When it comes to forced labor, the police don't see this necessarily as their job. You know, we don't we don't we don't get involved in that. That's the Department of Labor should be looking at that. And as a result of the Department of Labor or whatever it is that you have in your country, not having enough inspectors, not being able to get out there, not having enough information on what to do with these people, oftentimes instead of addressing their uh, human traffickingness, uh, many of them, if they're from another country, get deported and, and yeah. they're not able to be able to address that. Uh, many parts of the world, uh, including Canada, I'm sure, have scenarios where there are certain people who are better suited to be able to see whether there's an issue. Hotels, for example. 
if you know you ever a, a person who checks in with very little luggage and she's with an older guy or a woman and you see a lot of men coming in and out and they're not asking for towels and they don't want the room to be clean that's a pretty uh, in the, uh, big indicator banks are interested in this because profits generated from modern slavery 150 billion us dollars a year if any of that illegitimate money gets into a bank it's money laundering they get fined so all over the world, the banks are on the forefront of addressing this because they're trying to identify the nexus between a criminal activity and expenditures so that they can do big data searches to find out where the problem is. And then as a result of that, to be able to uh, to stop these types of things. And we're seeing a lot of those types of things set up when it comes to the general public seeing these types of things because of the clandestine nature, because this is a hidden thing. Most people wouldn't know what they saw, even if they saw it. But having said that, in my Canadian trip, I, I did a trip across Canada last year, 30 days, I had at least three people come up to me and say, you know, I was at that bus stop, I was at that train station, I saw something, it didn't feel right, I just listened to your talk, I think it was human trafficking, I wish I knew what to do. So you need a hotline, you need somebody to talk to. I know that you now have a hotline in Canada. We have a hotline. It's got multiple yeah. languages, that's a great thing. Uh, I think that's the thing that's, but unless you have general awareness to get people to respond and to look and open their eyes, it doesn't necessarily happen as much as we could reach in terms of the full potential. So I, I, I think I'm, as I listen to you, I'm, I'm seeing points of hope and light, the work of the banks, the work uh, of corporations uh, motivated by reputational risk and other factors. But I, I think of the work you do every day. In a way, you're surrounded by, by darkness, Matt, uh, the darkness and despair of the victims. I imagine that someone who has been trafficked, especially for sex, you, I don't know how you come back from that. Are you hopeful? You know, I mean, uh, there was a time when uh, I got so worked up as a young activist 25 years ago that I, I burned myself out and committed to never doing this again because I was taking on a lot of that pain and suffering. Um, and that happened a couple of times. And I have said, never again, I'm going to do this. But it's, as I say, there are certain people that this is in their DNA and it happens to be in my DNA. The way we approach this, if we look at 40 million people and the fact that basically the world is only helping 0.2% of them annually, not even a half percent, that can burn you out. And a lot of counter trafficking people, if they try to look at those numbers, will say, wow, we're working so hard and we're not having any kind of an impact. So we use the starfish parable. Now, for those of you who don't know what that is, uh, uh, father and son walking down the beach. There's uh, the beach is 10 kilometers long. There's all these starfish. They've been beached. The father picks one up, throws it in the water, picks another one, throws it in the water, picks another one, goes on for about a half mile. Son looks at the father and says, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm throwing the starfish in there. Kid says, you know, this beach is 10 kilometers long. There's no way you can save them all. Oh, well, what difference does it make? Father looks at the kid and says, well, to every starfish that gets into the water, it makes all the difference in the world. So we have to pat ourselves on the back. We have to encourage ourselves. We have to kind of get involved in addressing these types of things. Now, you know, it's, it's quite interesting to me. You know, you'll have terrorism that will basically, let's say in the worst period of time, a thousand people die around the year, uh, uh, around the world. This is another form of terrorism, but it's not directly affecting us. And so we don't feel the pain and suffering. But 40 million people have lost their life. They've lost their decision making. They've lost their freedom. They've lost their basic ability to determine things. I can't think of a bigger uh, kind of issue. If you're a woman in forced prostitution and you're not wearing a condom, you're going to get AIDS. OK, so it's a death sentence, too. And a lot of people die on construction sites or they die of abuse or they commit suicide and so forth. So we're talking out of 40 million people. Maybe there's, you know, uh, 30,000 people that die directly as a result of this. Why is it that we can't get our head around the fact that this is here and now and uh, it's driving and as a result of 30 years of working, we're still at 0.2 percent. So with all of that said, you might say, wow, Matt, you just... Uh, how can you possibly be optimistic about this? I'm super optimistic. We just haven't figured out the right combination yet. We will, you know, we'll keep trying. 
we fail, we'll do it again. Edison, it took him 10,000 times before he figured out how the light bulb worked. I'll keep talking on talks like this. I'll keep having discussions. I'll keep training. And eventually, the right combination of people will come together. And I, maybe it's going to be Canada. Maybe as a result of what you guys are doing, you're, you're the reasonable population size, you have caring, compassionate, warm, considerate people. Maybe you're going to be the ones that say, we are going to at least strive to be slavery free. We're going to do everything we can. I've been trying to get countries to do that all over the world. I'm waiting for somebody to say, we are going to make the effort. Maybe it's not possible, but you should at least make those kind of statements. I, I love the optimism I hear and the story about the father and the son and the starfish. Trust me, it will get repeated. It's very uh, 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 pertinent. I. I also hear the passion and the anger, and I think those are great combinations. You have passion and anger, you're devoted, you're committed uh, to moving the needle, as you know, as we like to say, but you're also optimistic. And I, for one, am incredibly grateful uh, that you have the DNA, and I want to wish you really all the very best. And I hope this is not the last time we interact. I'd also like to thank our listeners of this podcast. Uh, be sure to check out uh, Matt Friedman's website in the Mekong Club if you want to understand more or get involved with him more on these issues. But be also sure, please, to check out our other ca- podcasts. Plus, I invite you to write in to me and suggest topics and speakers that you think would be uh, pertinent for future episodes. We will continue to move the needle as we analyze how to tackle Uh, society's greatest challenges. Thank you and goodbye until next time. Thank you very much.